So it's now 7 p.m. So we are going to get started. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second session in our fall series of Green in the City, um, a program um, in partnership with the City of London, London Environmental Network, and London Public Library. Um, my name is Deepika, and I am the Environmental Project Specialist at the London Environmental Network. So we would like to acknowledge the history of the traditional territory and honor the long-standing relationships of the three local First Nations of this land and place in southwestern Ontario. The Attawandaran neutral peoples once settled this region alongside the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee peoples and used this land as their traditional hunting grounds. The three long-standing Indigenous groups of this geographical region are the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and Lenapewak. This land was originally occupied for its majestic forests and flowing rivers. Settlers cut down forests and dammed rivers, altering the natural environment and disconnecting people from the environment and their culture. The local river, which is known now as the Thames River, originally went by the name Dushkanzibi or Ashkaneshibi, both which roughly translate to Antler River. This river supports life, plants, animals, and humans who all use Nibe water to thrive. As we protect the Nibe, we protect life at the network and we want to see the local people, animals and plants thrive in a green and resilient community. We would also like to recognize the three First Nations communities, Downriver Dushkan Zibi, Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of Thames and Munsee Delaware Nation. We strive to work with these communities to continue to listen, learn and restore the natural area back to its original beauty, support environmental initiatives, and help our communities become climate resilient. We recognize the inequities connected to colonization and commit to working towards creating a community and city that is resilient, vibrant, and just. Given that we're learning about sustainable consumption tonight, we do want to reflect on the importance of the land and giving back to the land. We also invite you to read the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action and to reflect on your own acts of allyship with and actions to support Indigenous communities. The link to these calls to action will be shared in the chat for you to review. And now I will pass it over to Joanna. Thank you, Deepika. Uh, so my name is Joanna Kerr. I'm a librarian with the London Public Library here tonight at the beautiful Central Library downtown uh, in London, open until 9 p.m. if you're out and about. Uh, and I'll be the facilitator for tonight. Uh, and we have Kevin uh, behind the scenes helping out if Kevin wants to give a wave there as well. If you can see him, uh, he will be around later, uh, but helping us, uh, so we're grateful for that. So let's look at the agenda for this evening. Our first presenter uh, will be Hassan Habesh uh, from Goodwill Industries. Then we'll hear from Stephen Herrett, who will talk about fix it and repair fares. After that, we'll hear from Christiana Arsenault about the sustainability projects at Tepperman's. And finally, we'll hear from Eileen House with London's Buy Nothing Group for Woodfield and Old North. After all the speakers have presented, we'll have a question and answer period. Before we begin, I wanted to mention uh, that we are running a contest for Green in the City for the first time this year. To enter, you would attend at least one Green in the City session, just as you are at this very moment, and then choose an environmental action that you learned during the session and post a photo or video of you doing that action on social media with the hashtag, what makes a green city, we know it's long, uh, for a chance to win a one of 15 terrific prizes at the end of the series, including uh, things like composters uh, and gift certificates to local businesses like Hemans. Uh, so we've got that there. And there are so many examples tonight for things that you can uh, use, really practical examples uh, for our contest entry. So the deadline to enter is November 26th, and you can find full details on the Green in the City page of the London Environmental Network website. Okay, some etiquette. Uh, we just wanted to remind you uh, to submit your questions to the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time at all during our program and identify which speaker you're directing your question to and we will bring them into the discussion after the presentations. Please be respectful at all times, especially when using the Q&A box and the chat. Keep it fun, welcoming and inclusive for everyone. So now we're ready uh, for the main part of our program. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I want to introduce our first speaker, who is Hassan Habish. I will introduce him. He is the Vice President of Innovation 
and Enterprise Optimization at Goodwill Industries, Ontario Great Lakes. Hassan works to maximize social, economic, and environmental benefits along the supply chain with a focus on the diversion of goods in a circular economy. In managing large-scale initiatives, Hassan's expertise in sustainable operations and emerging technologies aims to develop economic systems to eliminate waste and the continual use of natural resources. So I'm very happy to welcome and hand it over to Hassan right now. And we'll, yeah, we'll get you unmuted. Great. No. Perfect, looks good. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Hassan Habash. I'm Vice President of uh, Innovation and Enterprise Optimization at Goodwill Industries. Uh, I've been with Goodwill now for five years. Uh, and um, my presentation today is about work. Uh, before we get going uh, about work, I just want to provide a little bit of background or the panel, uh, you know, uh, ask you to kind of, as the starting uh, uh, speaker today, provide a little bit of background on a circular economy. So really, uh, it's a definition, uh, uh, the problem statement. And so a circular economy is a model of production and consumption, which involves sharing, reusing, repairing, refurbishing, and recycling existing materials and products as, lo as long as possible with the aim of tackling global challenges, including climate change, biodiversity, uh, loss, waste, and pollution. A circular economy or an economic system aimed at eliminating waste and the continual use of natural resources is essential to sustainability. Um, it's going to guide your eyes to the, uh, the chart on the, uh, on the right. So again, in that circular economy, um, starting off with recover, collecting uh, end of life, uh, you know, with minimal waste. Uh, step two, reuse. So reusing those resources, uh, putting them through re re remanufacture and repair, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, recycling end of life products, uh, reforming design production. So really uh, providing the, uh, you know, the, um, the feedback back to industry so that uh, they, they can uh, you know re retransform or retransform the production uh, in order to develop greener or green or greener products uh, reduce to you know for the overall uh, you know for the consumer so minimizing waste uh, you know reducing resource dependency and again you go through that full circle uh, today we're going to be touching upon uh, resources or sorry re reuse and, and specifically with regards to worth it's remanufacture um, what are the problem statement? Humans are exceeding the Earth's natural replenishment capacity. The textile industry in particular is one of the world's largest polluters and emitters of carbon. Plastics, electronics, and furniture are among the many other consumer products playing havoc on the environment. Uh, sustainability has evolved far beyond green. Climate change, climate-related disaster are dominating the global stage. Uh, consumer demand for sustainable brands and solutions is growing. And we, we're talking about the brand worth today. Um, as the generation that will live out most of the future implications of climate and economic change matures into power, the pace of change will likely accelerate. To provide a little bit of backgrounder, um, Goodwill Ontario Great Lakes um, is, a, um, is really one uh, organization uh, that, that ties into Goodwill uh, International. And Goodwill International has 150 local organizations across the United States. Um, uh, uh, including Canada and 12 other countries uh, and have helped people find jobs, support their families and feel satisfaction that comes from working. Good organizations assist people through a variety of employment placement services, job training programs and other community-based services. The overarching goal uh, for Goodwill International is to strengthen and secure Goodwill's reuse and recycle position in a circular economy, to position Goodwill, Goodwill as an early adopter, investor, primary supplier of textile and other post-consumer goods, and partner with recycling solution technology innovators, creating a stable source of job creation, training opportunities, and revenue streams for Goodwill and aftermarkets, dramatically improving the envi environmental impact. Bit of a snapshot, 5.8 billion revenue, 2,700 plus locations, 135,000 employees, uh, ranked number one brand world uh, uh, by World Value Index, 35 million people access Goodwill for training and services uh, and 2.5 billion pounds diverted each year. Bit of a backgrounder on Goodwill Industries Ontario Great Lakes, which operates in Ontario. Um, Goodwill is a formal steward of used and end-of-life consumer goods, maximizing social, economic, and environmental benefit along the supply chain. Responsible diversion of goods within a circular economy is critical and becoming more acute given the changing dynamic of, uh, of climate and environment. 
uh, precariousness of salvage markets and shifting consumer attitudes. Goodwill Industries Ontario Great Lakes is a separately incorporated and uh, government nonprofit charitable organization serving across Ontario annually. Goodwill serves over 25,000 job seekers, employs 1,100 individuals made possible by collecting donations from and reselling to millions of generous environmental conscious uh, Ontario, Ontario citizens. Ultimately, Goodwill recycles and diverts 51 million pounds from landfill annually. Um, the, uh, the key there, 1,100 employees, uh, 51 million pounds uh, diverted annually, 52 million in revenue, 53 million total assets, 43, uh, 42 locations across uh, Ontario. A bit of background around worth. And so um, I'll, take it, I'll take a bit of a step back. So Goodwill Ontario Great Lakes has a number of work platforms. Uh, the number one platform, which everyone's aware of, is our, our donated goods retail, which is our retail division. So when you donate to Goodwill, um, those, uh, those donations are processed uh, at, our, at our retail stores uh, and hit our, hit our sales floor. Whatever doesn't sell in a four-week cycle at our retail stores um, is pulled off that floor. And anything that's deemed non-saleable that doesn't hit that sales floor, it all gets collected and sent back to our warehouse located here in London, Ontario on White Oak Road. And um, it's when it goes through a second attempt of generating revenue, which is our pound shop. So items that, that, that sell at a, at a lower value by the pound, and then whatever doesn't sell by the pound ends up in the aftermarket stream. And that's where worth comes in. So uh, th those goods, you know, so diverting those goods from landfill really I, you know, is, is, is the uh, ultimate goal of worth, but at the same time too, also uh, providing skills development and training for those individuals that face barriers to employment, um, as well as newcomers to Canada. In 2018, Worth began as a, a two-year research project funded by Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada and the Community College Social Innovation Fund. The project was initiated by the Fashion Design Program at Fanshawe College in partnership with Goodwill Industries Ontario Great Lakes. Worth is a social solution for integration into the Canadian workforce intended to increase the value of apparel workers' labor and the garments they produce while diverting textile waste from landfill. So really highlighting uh, fast fashion um, and the, um, the poor uh, work practices and the low uh, scale of uh, wages that are paid overseas. With the enormous availability of cheap clothing term fast fashion, hyper consumerism of the apparel and its excessive di disposal has led to a society that does not value apparel workers or the environment. Garments are manufactured by anonymous workers from countries such as China, Bangladesh and Vietnam where labor costs can be less than a tenth of that found in Canada and the US. Seetheworth.com um, uh, is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the site that we launched. Goodwill launched uh, Worth uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so we just, so we just uh, launched uh, very recently. Um, and uh, the uh, goal is to scale Worth and scale Worth through collaborative uh, uh, relationships with industry partners. Uh, the London Community Recovery Network funding uh, was also provided uh, by the City of London to support skills development and training programs with a focus on graduating 16 sewing machine operators in 2021, 32 operators in 2022, and 32 operators in 2023. Expanding worth by building collaborative industry partnerships through our business-to-business -business program promoting responsible diversion of goods within a circular economy. So today I'll be presenting our, our, our uh, our, our B2C, which is business, business to customer or consumer directly, which is our online platform, and which will highlight and showcase some of the work that uh, has been done by uh, the, the great team uh, of, our, of our apparel manufacturing team. Um, and then I'll touch upon some of the uh, objectives that we're looking to do to scale work um, on the business platform. You know, actually, maybe what I'll do is before I, before I jump into the, um, the website itself, I'll take a step back. So right now, Goodwill is also partnering with uh, the, there was an announcement last week, it was Waste Diversion Week. We partnered with the beer store. Uh, the beer store and Goodwill have partnered on a uniform collection program. All those uniforms that are collected by beer store employees are collected and brought back to uh, Goodwill. Goodwill will actually in turn uh, uh, have our design team design products for the beer store and then in turn resell it to promote that full circularity back into uh, either selling it to the um, you know at the stores, their employees, or in the retail locations that provide the customers. We also partnered with Western University. If you go to the Western University bookstore, you'll see worth there as well. So any items that are that were not sold, damaged, uh, returned, uh, not deemed saleable, were provided to Goodwill. We had our design team design it. Our sewing machine operators 
manufacture and then resell it back to uh, Western and uh, they sell it in their bookstore and also online. The last component is we're actually partnering with Fashion Takes Action as well right now and uh, Canadian Tire on a pilot program. We're collecting uh, textiles uh, at sport check stores. Those, uh, those items are going to be brought back to uh, Goodwill uh, and prepared for uh, refiberization to create felt. That felt product will come back to our apparel, our apparel manufacturing platform, designed uh, by, the products designed by Canadian Tire, manufactured and then resold back to Canadian Tire to again promote that full circularity. So without further ado, I'll jump back in here and we'll uh, click on this link and we'll go over to work. Thanks, Hassan. And there's about two minutes left. Perfect timing. So Worth is not a fashion brand. Um, you know, the objective of, of work is uh, of Worth is definitely work. Uh, the, def the, uh, the objective of Worth is for the people, for the planet, for the community. Skilled workers earning fair living wages and a safe, envi and safe environment shouldn't be a novel concept. The fashion industry sends millions of uh, tons of clothing to landfill every year, most of which could be reused or recycled. The sale of every worth product helps a person with barriers to employment take a step towards self-sufficiency. A bit of a snapshot in the product. And what I'll do is I'll go in and maybe do a little snapshot on shop. Our story. This is not a fashion brand. This is an evol evolution of a broken industry. We transform end-of-use textiles in a symbol of sustainability, creating positive change through inter intentional design. Every purchase helps provide work and skilled training to people who face barriers to employment. We are rethinking what it means to shop, remanufacturing what others have thrown away and reclaiming our worth. And I'll provide a little bit of snapshots. So there's uh, four lines, the remanufacturer apparel line, upcycling, upcycled accessories, home goods, and eco-friendly pet product. So to give you a, an idea, I'll just click on, uh, here shirts and you'll see that uh, the shirts are actually manufactured from textiles uh, post con post consumer uh, and uh, the designs were all designed by the school of fashion design at Fanshawe College I also provide a little bit of a, another backgrounder here on uh, some of the other items, including accessories, bucket hats. Our primary target audience is the Gen X, uh, Gen X, or sorry, Gen Z, Gen Z, Gen Z plus. Um, so again, designed to geared towards uh, that uh, target market. And I'll just go back here and share a little bit more on some of the product line and also under home goods. Just to give you a snapshot into some of the some of the items that uh, we're remanufacturing, and again, manufactured on the platform, um, primarily by individuals that uh, new newcomers to Canada and individuals that face barriers to employment. I'll click on toys as well. Give you a snapshot there. So join the evolution uh, by uh, by shopping and promoting a full circular economy. Terrific. Thank you so much, Hassan. That was wonderful to see the products, um, but to also just see the evolution of your story. Really great stuff. So uh, questions for Hassan, get them into the Q&A and we'll bring it into the discussion later. But thank you so much. It was really helpful to see the website as well and see how that works. Great. Thank you. Great. Right. So um, we're going to move on to our next speaker now. We're going to welcome Stephen Herrett. So Stephen is active in promoting London's urban agriculture strategy as a member of the Urban Ag Strategy Steering Committee. He's a community gardener, a fruit tree care specialist, seed saver, and executive committee chairperson for Friends of Urban Agriculture London. Stephen is also a community liaison and tree specialist for Reforest London and the coordinator of the Fix It and Repair Fair, aligning community partners and talented tinkerers with people that have things that need to be repaired and fixed. So I'm gonna welcome Stephen. Good evening, it's nice to be here tonight. Um, Joanna is going to run the slide presentation for me. So okay is our keyword to change the slide. And we're uh, gonna skip back to the beginning. Sorry about that. That's I'm gonna okay. fix that. I was talking to you, but you weren't there. Uh, so we are just gonna do, I'm just gonna stop the share for a moment here while I just do a little thing. 
and then we'll get it going. So thanks for everyone's patience. I'm gonna reshare from the first slide. I think we're on board now. And how about that? Excellent, okay. So I'd like to do a little touch on the social, economic and environmental role of repair, okay? So the, the social aspect of community repair, it's been said, is a citizen-driven, locally organized public event in which volunteer repairers and people with an object in need of repair are matched. The motivated individuals and communities are working together on a local level to extend the useful life of a wide range of products to teach repair skills and also communicate the value of product repair rather than replacement to the wider community. Okay. The economic side, there are more, the more times the product circulates in the system without changes or with just small repairs, the most value is extracted from the materials and energy invested initially to make the product. So this is a very important highlight of how repair fits with the circular economy and sustainable consumption, okay? The environmental side is large. It largely speaks for itself, but um, an example from a European study is extending the lifetime of the toaster in the EU by 10% could save around 4,000 tons of CO2 and prevent 60 tons of waste per annum. And extending the use of a t-shirt in the EU by 10% would in turn reduce about 100,000 tons of CO2. Repair and maintenance activities are crucial to achieve this goal, okay? Some of the challenges of uh, sustainable consumption within the repair area are a lack of spare parts, a lack of technical information, a lack of knowledge, uh, parts and assemblies that are glued in place, tamper-proof cases, proprietary tools, digital locks, and the needed societal and cultural behavioral change. So a couple pictures on the side, if it can't be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, refinished, resold, recycled, or composted, then it should be restricted, redesigned, or removed from production. And on the, uh, the right is the iFixit, Repair Manifesto, which has some very good points listed in it also, okay? The eight R's in this diagram, I just want to bring forth that I personally feel Refuse is the most important one to remember when thinking about sustainable consumption. By refusing to buy a product, by refusing that, um, um, that impulse buy, it can change the manufacturer's way of manufacturing and producing their goods. If, if they're not um, being responsible in how materials such as packaging are disposed of, then by refusing to buy these products, there will result in change. Repair is also a very important part and rethink. Be mindful of your consumption, your relationship with things and your relationship with the earth, okay? The Fix It and Repair, the Fix It and Repair Fair, it began on uh, September 20th, 2019 as a collaboration Fix-It Cafe at 211 King Street, okay? And since, since that time, 
We've had uh, fix it and repair fairs in the Old East Village, Kensington Village, Chartwell Riverside Retirement Residence, Thames Park, with um, and and Beacock and Sherwood branches of the London Public Library, hosted by community groups like Nellis, the Northeast Community Engagement. Um, through London Intercommunity Health Center, the Northwest London Community Resource Center, Oxford Park Community Association, Kensington Village Association, and London's Community Gardens Program. Okay. The talented hands of our tinkerers, sewists, and fixers make this all possible. Okay. Sharing knowledge, sharing tools, sharing experiences, and sharing stories are all part of the Fix It and Repair Fair. Okay. Sometimes it's necessary to put our heads together to get the experience and, and uh, get some ideas of the next step in repair, teaching, working through the troubleshooting process is also a part of the social engagement that takes place okay we can fix it we have had one anomaly event which is an outlier we had 100 percent of the items brought in went out fixed other than that i would say we're close to 70 percent for um, what is being fixed at the Fix It and Repair Fair. And that's my quick presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So good. Uh, I'm just going to mention uh, that uh, Stephen and I were part of an event last week, uh, uh, Saturday actually, and it was really a global fix it fair. And I was amazed by that. People, you know, using their phone to close in on their dishwasher or their, uh, you know, fan. Uh, it was wonderful. So, Stephen, like you really kind of captured the importance of this. That study was really terrific. Um, but also just empowering people to fix something so that it, it can be applied to, to anything after that. The virtual repair fair is quite a wonderful thing. And uh, I did forget to mention that we have now done that. Um, we've unclogged a shower drain. So that's something that you just couldn't bring in. So that's where the virtual really has come to light. Plus a little better than a YouTube video because there are fixers there from around the world to to point things out. I sat in on a clock repair session, so I'm a little bit more confident about some of the things I need to know when I get around to that old cuckoo clock. Yes, indeed. I love that. Um, and Stephen, are you able to share the next Fix It Fair, the virtual one in the chat, the one um, that's going to happen in November? I can find that and do that. Great. Yeah, if not, I can do that. Good, good. Okay, so thank you so much, Stephen. We're going to uh, move to our next speaker. Um, just such great stuff here. So, um, right, we're going to move to Christiana Arsenault. So, Christiana is the Director of Distribution for Tepperman's. She has been with Tepperman's working out of the London facility, heading up the sustainability sector for over four years. Her projects include implementing the mattress recycling program, water monitoring systems, partnering with Habitat for Humanity, reduction of chemical cleaners and pollinator gardens at several stores. Prior to this, she worked for Acklands Granger, getting the new Toronto DC building LEED certified and creating a watershed pond and pollinator gardens. And with that, I'm very happy to welcome Christina. Christiana, sorry. Hello. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, okay, can everybody see that? Looks great. Perfect. Okay. So, hi, I'm Christiane Arsenal, Director of Distribution for Sustainability at Tepperman's, and I'm thrilled to be talking to you about what our team does and the efforts we do. At Tepperman's, we've been servicing southwestern Ontario for 96 years now. 
and we really have close ties with our community and sustainability is part of our guiding principles. We aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, save energy and minimize waste to landfills. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about energy. Everybody can see the second slide? Looks great. Perfect, okay. So we started in 2015 on uh, low hanging fruit LED lighting. And in our first year, we were able to see 71% reduction in our lighting uh, energy use. Uh, we're now uh, have every store, we're just finishing the last one with everything, including our distribution centers on LED lighting. All our roofs in our uh, facilities are TPO membrane roofs, and they reflect sunshine. Why is that important? Well, during the summer, when the heat is hitting the building and actually draws less electricity to keep them um, uh, cooled down and less HVAC usage. All our vehicles in our uh, distribution centers are electric vehicles, so we have no off-gassing there. Two of our distribution centers have HVAC controls. So I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, prior to having HVAC controls on each one of our HVAC units up on the roof, it was either 100% on or 100% off. You couldn't dial them down. So now we're able to, in the summer, if one area of the store is cooler than another, that HVAC system can be brought down to 40% and be drawing far less electricity. Uh, with, our, with our rooftop units, it'll provide 25 to 30% energy savings for uh, drawing from uh, the, the grid. All our stores have EV, which is electric vehicle charging stations for our customers. And we're proud to say that uh, the Energy Star uh, certification happened uh, last year for four of our five stores or 80, uh, 80 um, score or better. Uh, we track our waste. So you can see that we've been uh, uh, increasing year over year. Uh, in the year, uh, this year, we're 73% right now diverted from the landfill. We have a goal of 2025, which happens to be our 100th anniversary. So that's just around the corner. And we've set our goal for 80%. So talking about waste, uh, this is a, a great story. We um, partner with Youth Opportunities Unlimited, and they provide training uh, and experience for their uh, youth uh, who collect our cardboard and our uh, plastics. And right now we're up to 400 tons of uh, cardboard alone uh, redu a reduction. Polystyrene, which is styrofoam uh, recycling. Uh, we uh, have partnered with Second Wind Recycling who pick up our styrofoam. Uh, we actually compress and condense all the styrofoam that comes back from uh, delivery. So they all come back to our store and we cold compress them and those bricks uh, actually are made into things like outdoor furniture, roofing tiles, coat hangers, peanut packaging materials. So it's great that there is a second life for styrofoam. Wood recycling, so any uh, pallets that we don't require or we're not gonna use, they can be made, they're picked up. Uh, they're actually made into uh, new pallets or they can become biofuel or they're mulched, uh, chipped into mulch for gardens. Our mattress recycling, uh, in 2020 alone, we diverted 86 uh, tons of mattresses. All the mattress is broken down. So anything that's the foam, the material, the metals, the plastics, all of that is recycled and made into other uh, items. So we're thrilled about that program. Uh, here's another uh, uh, great story where we partnered with Habitat for Humanity. So uh, our customers may come in and when they purchase new appliances, they may ask us to bring back their appliances. All of those are donated to the ReStore and the ReStore either refurbishes and resells them or they break them down to all their components and get back money for the metals. That money in turn turns into homes for well-deserving families. So it's a great way uh, to give back to the community. We also hand out pamphlets in our stores when someone, let's say, is buying a sofa 
and they don't know what to do with their sofa, we give this pamphlet, it tells them the local number and they're able to call it and have that sofa picked up from their home, which uh, again is uh, reuse and uh, the circular economy. Um, our environment uh, is really important to us. So we uh, partnered with Ontario uh, Natorscape Pollinator Pathways and the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority. Uh, in last year, we started the seeds for this. And this year we were able to uh, plant a 2,500 square foot uh, bee and uh, um, butterfly pollinator garden in London. Uh, our Windsor store was so thrilled about it that they jumped on board and they added a thousand square feet uh, at their facility. And our Ancaster store did 150 square feet. Uh, we have now uh, started uh, the pollination garden behind our building. It's going to be 30,000 square feet of dedicated area for a pollinator garden. And it'll be in full bloom sometime next summer. So we're really excited about doing this project. Uh, reduction of chemical cleaners. So we uh, invest, uh, invested in a Tursano system in all six of our stores. It actually takes ordinary tap water, adds oxygen, ionizes the water, and it's able to uh, act as a disinfectant. So instead of putting any kind of chemicals on our desks and our uh, the things that we use, we're actually using this ionized water and we're really thrilled with the reduction of chemicals in all our facilities. Uh, this is uh, uh, the flowy. So about three years ago, um, we had uh, we have students that come in from Western who are sustainable um, master's program. And one of them introduced us to the flowy. We called up. It was actually being used for home use. And we said, can we be an experiment and try this in our corporate world? And they said, sure, that would be great. We tried it in London at first. It actually, we have an app on our phone and the app goes off if there's anything unusual. Uh, when it has gone off, we've sent someone to go look in the building and sure enough, there's probably, there is a toilet running and we're able to stop it right away. This is really great for the environment and not to mention you're saving money because you don't have that water going down the drain constantly. All of our stores have this monitoring system and it's worked out great because it really, uh, alerts you to a problem immediately. Uh, we also uh, track our greenhouse gas emissions. We did our first ever greenhouse gas inventory in 2019, both on scope one and scope two. Our goal we have set is a reduction of 4.2% a year. In 2020, I'm proud to say that we actually did a 6.3% reduction and we're still uh, looking for ways to uh, reduce our gas emissions. Uh, last slide is on our supply chain. So supply chain, uh, while all our, uh, is looking for eco-friendly uh, products, I'm just gonna point out one, which is kind of cool, the CR Plastics, the colorful chairs you see there, that's a local company in Stratford, Ontario. They make all their outdoor furniture 100% from recycled uh, material, recycled plastic. Great news story. Uh, wonderful to be able to sell something that, that you know is coming that could have been in the landfill and has become beautiful furniture. So I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Christiana. Wonderful examples and great to see the, the images, even the, the being able to monitor the water on your phone. That's incredible. It just so many diverse examples. Thank you so much. Um, terrific. Okay, we're doing excellent for time too. Thanks everyone. And I'm going to now introduce our final speaker for the evening and then we'll move to your questions. So feel free to add questions at any time. I've seen some in the chat come in. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A as well. So now we are going to uh, welcome Eileen House. So I'll introduce Eileen. So she's lived in the old North Woodfield area for 15 years. She remembers thinking that our entire economic system was unsustainable while in grade 11 economics uh, and has been seeking out modes of effective resistance and change ever since. 
buying less, reusing more, learning how to fix and maintain things have been part of her lifestyle for a very long time. The Buy Nothing movement is a great fit for these goals and her role in administering the Facebook page is a simple and useful way to contribute to big changes on a neighborhood level. So now I will invite Eileen to join us. Hi, everyone can hear me? Yep. yep. Everything's good, okay. Um, hi, I'm Eileen, and I'm here to talk about the Buy Nothing Project, which is an internet or uh, Facebook group that is saving the planet one gift at a time. Um, I'm currently one of the administrators of the Old North Woodfield Group, which is comprised of a large geographical area stretching from Soho up to the university, so right through the middle of downtown. Our group is very active. We have more than 1,500 members exchanging gifts every day. Um, in its most simple form, the Buy Nothing Project is a free stuff portal supported on the Facebook platform. We use Facebook because it's free and it's uh, widely accessible and we don't talk about politics. <laughs> um, to give you an idea of the kinds of things and stories moving between Buy Nothingers, I thought I'd give you a bit of a tour of my house. So we're just going to switch the camera around. This dining room set came to me this summer. This is a Nechi dressmaking sewing machine from the 50s, which was a gift from someone whose parents were downsizing. And mom was really loath to let it go, but it wouldn't fit in their new accommodation. And she was thrilled to have someone who would use it take possession. This table was a trade, actually, for a little mid-century modern deal I had, and uh, the pandemic gave me a chance to learn about refinishing. The pandemic ended, and this one didn't get refinished. So um, that's a good sort of look at some of the things that move back and forth, just from a material point of view. Um, when I asked why the table, which is really beautiful, wasn't sold, I was told that it was gifted to this family and they felt that it should be gifted in return. So that's the way that we talk about our stories are the other side of what's happening with Go Nothing or Buy Nothing Pages. So the project was founded by Rebecca Rockefeller and Liesl Clark in Bainbridge Island, Washington in July of 2013. So they just wanted to see if a local hyper tiny gift economy could work in their neighborhood. And it's since blossomed into a worldwide social movement with groups in 44 nations. Gift economies in this form move things, services and gratitude around without any cash changing hands. Local groups form gift economies that are complementary and parallel to local cash economies. Whether people join because they'd like to get rid of things that are cluttering up their lives or simply save money from getting things for free, they quickly discover that buy nothing groups are not just another free recycling platform. A gift economy's real wealth is the people involved and the web of connections that form to support them. Time and again, members from our group find new ways to give back to the community, spend more time on the page interacting with their neighbors, and we bring a lot of humor, entertainment, and free stuff into the lives of our neighbors. The Buy Nothing Project is about the scarcity model of our cash economy, setting that model aside in favor of creatively and collaboratively sharing from the abundance around us. Like we have lots of stuff, right? <laughs> Buy Nothing Project rules are super simple. You can post anything you'd like to give away, like anything. Um, you can lend things and you can share things. This includes non-fungible goods like skills and time or even just labor. Sometimes kids are like, especially during the pandemic, is there anyone who wants their leaves raked or their dog food picked up? These kinds of things were exchanged on our page during, well, during lockdown. Um, so the rules are simple. You can ask for anything. You have to keep it legal. We don't trade in bombs. Um, and this is a tricky one from an administration point of view, but it's not a discussion board. So there are three kinds of posts on buy nothing groups. You can give things away, you can ask for things, and you can express gratitude. Any other discussion, we kind of move into neighborhood pages and um, different platforms for those kinds of communications. Um, 
We regularly encourage members to dream big in their asks and to consider the value of things in their own environment. Sometimes we look at things so many times and until someone says, I'm looking for a picnic basket, does it occur to us that we haven't touched our picnic basket in 10 years and maybe it needs to go somewhere where it's going to be used? Um, some things are perpetually in motion, like if you ever need moving boxes or packing materials, hit your buy nothing page. We have a strange prevalence of hangers. Hangers are always on the move. And we also have something that really started during the pandemic as well, which are clothing trains. And these move from household to household and you take what you want and you give what you want. We currently have uh, two or three women's clothing trains on the move. We have a children's and a men's. And these are everything from Hugo Boss suits to like two small long johns. And then eventually it kind of gets to the point where it's been around and then we donate to Goodwill. So hi, Goodwill. <laughs> um, so that keeps stuff out of the, the landfill. And some things are really intangible, but incredibly meaningful. This one's hard for me to talk about, but this summer, one of our neighbors posted to borrow a wagon so that their toddler could take their old dog for a last walk. <laughs> and I think our entire community had a bit of a heartbreak there. <laughs> Um, but that's how we support ourselves in ways that aren't just things. Um, some things move to places where they will be used and cherished, which is particularly meaningful when people are downsizing um, with their parents or they're moving and they can't take everything with them. Um, participants share things mundane and meaningful in equal measure and throughout it all connect with each other by means of shared personal stories and helping each other out. So much like any social organization, the Buy Nothing group faces some challenges. The Old North Woodfield group is currently twice the size recommended by the Buy Nothing project for optimal functioning. So as an admin team, we're actually in the process of aligning the geographic boundaries to accommodate two groups. Um, and here's where it gets interesting. As a team, we're in some way redesigning our neighborhood maps. Um, in Whitfield Old North, we have an incredibly diverse economic landscape, and we're trying to avoid reinforcing economic inequalities that are built into the urban planning of our city by creating two new groups that will encompass the entire spectrum of lived economic realities in this part of the city. So one of the things that happens in post-war development is um, the ghettoization of various communities. In our neighborhood, it might be really easy to look at the map and say, well, you cleave off Old North and you section off um, Woodfield and then Soho kind of floats on its own. And what that does is reinforce the class distinctions that are actually built into this part of the city. So what it's really challenging for us to kind of say, okay, we have way too many people giving way too many things and we'd like to spread those capacities around in a way that isn't necessarily natural in the geography. Um, we're creating, so the, this matters because above and beyond the exchange of decor and garden plants, which we do a lot of, um, these groups meet basic survival needs in our community. This is a difficult part of the group to talk about, but in our groups, we see a real need for basic humanitarian items like food and personal care products. Balancing these fundamental needs with the guidelines of the community presents particular challenges around offers to send money, and buy gift cards. So those address the need. Somebody says, I need food, well, I'll buy you a gift card. But what it does is actually discourage people from checking their pantry and giving from their own abundance. So we really try to encourage people to look around and see how they can help in a way that's not reaching for a wallet. It also puts people who maybe don't have a big juicy wallet in a position to question the value of their own gifts, which is not what we're here for. Um, so we have had numerous conversations on the site about charity and philanthropy and other neighborhood groups are drawn into these issues by by problems we have that arise on, on the Buy Nothing group. So it really draws like the Piccadilly area neighborhood group together with the Woodfield neighborhood, with Old North, and these forums become places to talk about issues that have come out of the Buy Nothing project, which I think is just amazing. So philosophy and practice are constantly under review as we move through seasons and try to hold the community in grace. 
As administrators, we try to gently and kind, kindly steer the ways support is offered in such a way that gratitude and compassion are the forefront of the actions on our page, but also encourages sustainable giving and interaction in the groups without taking advantage of individual generosity or goodwill. The Buy Nothing Project isn't an answer to any particular social or environmental challenge, but it does contribute to the sense of community and togetherness in struggle that is so sorely missing from many of our daily interactions. Exchanging stuff brings people together and gives us all a way to help each other in small and large ways. So go on and give your stuff away. It feels really good in ways that might surprise you. So that's, that's me. Eileen, thank you so much. It, even in our first conversations, this enlarged my idea of what this is. And your example of, you know, a cart for an old dog, like a wagon. Um, I mean, this is exactly the kind of story that 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 comes from getting to know people, sharing, and as you say, reflecting on our own abundance. So I love that phrase. Thank you so much. Thank you. Beautiful story. So. With that, I, I mean, I can't thank enough all the stories that we've heard tonight. And I have a feeling that even our panelists are maybe, you know, seeing connections maybe that they didn't see before. I don't know, but, um, but I am noticing a few questions. So I think what we can do is move to the question and answer um, period. But um, I also just have a question for our panelists too, if we have time. So I'm going to start with this question here and, um, and just see who could answer it. Um, I have an idea, but uh, Laura asks in the chat um, about uh, peanut packaging material. So, um, so it was from an Alberta company and it was vegetable based. And as she's saying, she actually put one in her mouth and it melted without an awful taste. Um, so she's asking, like, can we ever see larger forms of quote styrofoam moving in this direction? So I had a, a sense it might be you, Christiana, that could answer. Does that seem like a good fit? Um, it, it really does because one of the things we ask all the time is what packaging material is used from. How can we avoid, let's say styrofoam use more cardboard because we know that we can put that in the landfill. So the idea of having something that could be edible or maybe dissolves and leaves no trace like that peanut packaging would be something that I think a lot of people would be interested in. And definitely uh, that sounds in the forefront. I'd, yeah. be, I'd be interested in that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, does anyone else want to address that from a different point of view, maybe? I know uh, maybe Hassan might have something to add on that, just in terms of um, the kind of supply chain issues. Hassan, does that, uh, does that make sense? Uh, and I should mention that Hassan uh, had to kind of uh, deal with um, connectivity issues tonight um, because he had to leave home and find another connection because his connection was down. So he may not be right available at the moment. I'm sorry, I just heard my name. I'm sorry, I had to step away for, for a brief oh, moment. Oh, don't apologize. I was just telling people how, you know, what lengths you went to to be with us tonight. So we really appreciate it. Um, we're just talking about the question and I, I just wanted to check in with you if you did have um, uh, any thoughts on it in terms of sort of, oh, I'll be back in a minute here. <laughs> okay, that happens. Um, so there was someone talking about uh, peanut packaging material from an Alberta company that was vegetable based. Um, and um, the idea of maybe moving packing materials like styrofoam, styrofoam in that direction. I don't know if you've had any um, interaction in that way. I'm sorry. No, I don't. But uh, I can definitely look into it and get back. And oh, there's, no. There's a follow up. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't. No, it's okay. I just wasn't sure what part of the 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 side of things you were on there. Does anyone else want to jump in with that one? All right. Yeah, it may not be familiar there, but um, yeah, but it does sound like a good alternative. So I'm going to just look through. I am seeing another question, so I'll I'll um, send that out to the group. So here's the question, and I'll um, just go to each speaker in turn, um, because I think everyone might have an opinion on this one. So what do you think 
are the biggest barriers the city of London faces in the transition towards a more sustainable and green economy. So um, I'm gonna start just in the order I'm seeing people here. Um, Eileen, is it okay if we start with you on this one? Okay, we just have to unmute you. And Deepika, are you able to do that? Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, what barriers do I think the City of London faces? Um, integrated transit is certainly an issue both regionally and locally. The lack of planning for a bus station where people can use the washroom and get a cup of coffee was a distressing moment in the, the recent transit redesign. Hubbing all of your buses through downtown with no viable place to have a rest just really discourages that kind of use. And uh, the transit isn't really designed to support our outlying manufacturers. You have to have a car to get there. So there are barriers to employment, again, built right into our geography, which just is something London, London is very reliant on cars. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. For sure. So, um, Christiana, would you like to answer the question? So the biggest barriers the city faces towards a more sustainable and green economy. So I love your answer about uh, the transit. Um, I was thinking about um, all the parkland and, and increasing that. I know that there's a need for us to uh, plant even more trees to be able to be more with nature. Uh, it's things like can you plant a different kind of garden in your home? Um, something that is actually going to be more to our uh, landscape rather than foreign type of things. Um, we really need to focus on being more green and less tarmac, less roads, uh, less parking lots, and more about how do we green up and create more oxygen. Uh, without trees, we're never going to have that circular where we're taking all the carbon dioxide and all that thing, all the bad stuff out of the earth and bringing it back in. We've got to cool down the earth and there's too much tarmac. Yeah. Thanks, Christiana. Very good points. Um, and Stephen, I'll invite you to uh, talk to the question too about what barriers we face to move towards a more sustainable economy. I'm, I'm going to reflect back to one of the slides uh, that discussed the challenges of the repair. And that was the cultural and societal behavioral change. People must change the way that they're doing things. I want to just say that landfill is not sustainable. Any organic and I'm not gonna call it waste, but any organic resources that land in the landfill are wasted. Um, composting in your garden, um, that is feeding other microbes. So it's not being wasted, but it is being returned through nature. Nature does not waste. It's being returned into the soil so you can have a great garden the following year. Nearly all the available land left in London for someone to start a community garden is on an old landfill. And that spreads from the center of the city right out to the edges. So now we have a landfill still outside of the city, but it's piling up. And any organic waste, you wonder where the smell comes from, that's where the smell comes from. So that's the huge challenge is the behavioral change. Everything else could be great if we changed our behaviors. Yeah, well said. Well said, Stephen. And Hassan, I'll put the question to you now in terms of barriers to a more sustainable economy. No, I agree with um, all the comments made by the, uh, the panelists. Um, so I'll just add um, two points. One uh, is divert, you know, diverting uh, from landfill, uh, finding uh, more sustainable ways to use um, uh, uh, materials uh, that can be diverted from landfills. So, for example, textiles. You know, one of the um, you know one of the biggest uh, pushes that, that Goodwill is working on now is actually diverting textile from landfill 
uh, and um, you know appreciating that those textiles may not necessarily be uh, saleable um, or, or for reuse. And so we're working with both uh, Fanshawe College and the uh, University of Western Ontario IC for the Institute for Chemicals from Alternative Resources in order to find alternative uses for um, for textiles in particular, but you know really diverting. Um, materials from landfill. In this case here, uh, creating a product uh, with industry called um, cotton shoddy, which is used in the manufacturing of insulation for automobiles. So diverting it and then working with downstream recyclers to create the product, but, but really being that being that innovator and working with uh, you know local academics and also supported by another CCSIF grant. The second point that you know, and with I guess with um, with ICFAR, um, you know we're creating a product called Biochar, which, you know, which uh, it, it's, a, it's the agriculture industry and it retains microbial growth in the ground uh, and, and, uh, and um, promotes, uh, it promotes microbial growth and retains moisture in the ground. So again, all created by items that can be diverted from landfill. Um, the second is producer responsibility. I think it's important that, so bigger than just London, but really putting the, the onus back on producers uh, to be greener, greener in the manufacturing of the product uh, and looking for green solutions in their manufacturing or using uh, items that uh, are recycled in their in their manufacturing process. Thank you. Yeah, really good points, everyone. Thank you. I have some other questions that have come in. I'm just monitoring the chat here, um, and uh, I'll ask uh, Deepika or Kevin to flag me if I've missed anything here. But um, I see a question about green bins for composting, someone who's moved here from Vancouver and is wondering where they are. So I should say that our first Green in the City session in our winter um, uh, session of the series uh, did address this. I'm going to, um, we do have some City of London staff on the call. I don't know if they want to jump into this one, but um, otherwise, we're very happy to include information in our follow-up email to all the registrants about the status of that. So it is in the works. It is coming. Is uh, I think I can safely say that. Um, I'm just going to see here that I'm not being corrected. Yes. Um, so it is coming. I mean, I don't think any of our panelists want to jump into the green bin discussion. Um, but um, as I say, I know city staff are here and could jump in if they wanted to. But I think... Um, I think the best way might be um, uh, Carolina to um, to respond to your question in our email that's going out to you, if that's okay. Let me know in the chat um, there. So it's on its way. That's a short answer. Um, Right, and I, I really like the comment here in the chat too, if you haven't seen it, um, someone saying, I've always thought that every citizen should be required to take a tour of the landfill to be able to live in a city. I like that. Um, and someone uh, giving some advice in the chat too about where to buy uh, um, compost bins. Yeah, and thanks uh, thanks there in the chat as well. Uh, we're expected to have a curbside green bin program beginning in the fall next year, 2022. Thank you, Kevin. Excellent, this is going very well. Okay, so I am seeing another question here and we're doing well for time. We're gonna go to 8.10, so we have about seven more minutes, perfect. So here's the question, um, and it is for Christiana. Has Tepperman's provided assistance to firms or companies uh, in their industry and other industries on how to do the things that Tepperman's does to help save the planet? Any thoughts there, Christiana? Uh, that's actually a good question. Um, we have had a local committee that was in Kitchener and in Ancaster uh, that have paired up with schools and have actually gone out and done lesson planning and teaching about diversity and uh, about the diverse type of uh, things that we do and how you can be more sustainable and they get involved in the education of that. So definitely, and we're more than willing, our web page is up there, we're more than willing to share our information and network. Uh, I also find that networking on um, different chat groups is a great way of getting information out. Excellent, thanks, Christiana. Also, I wanted to ask a question. If we could find out where that peanut packing material came from and we can get that information, that would be great. Excellent, good, good point. Okay, so Laura, um, if you're able to share the name of that Alberta company, 
we will uh, learn more about it that way. Terrific. Great. Uh, okay, so there is there's some comments here. I'm just scanning through just someone um, expressing agreement with Hassan's comments about expecting employers to be more sustainable. Very much so. And I see another, oh, people are uh, have comments too. Great. Yes, of course. Yeah. So that, that site is in the chat too. Get involved. Um, London.ca slash green bin uh, for more information on that for the folks asking about green bins and curbside uh, composting. Excellent. Okay. So uh, I'm going to just do another scan here. I thought there was something else. I don't know, Kevin, Deepika, if you want to flag something, but I think I, I, I'd just like to add about what Stephen said about the green bin. Um, he's absolutely right. I used to live in Toronto, had green bin forever. And when that was introduced, we actually went to one very small bag of garbage every two weeks. Our household garbage went down tremendously. You don't know how much green things you throw in the garbage. And when that comes in 2022, People are going to, it's, it'll be like a miracle when you realize how much can be reused and you can go and buy the dirt because the, they create earth and then you can go and buy that. So that is really thrilling to know that's coming. Yeah, I think it's going to be a big change for sure. Um, and so I'd like to ask everyone, again, totally voluntary, just jump in if you'd like to share, but um our contest that we're running with Green in the City is about someone taking an action that they can tell us about to enter the contest. So I'll just invite any of our four panelists to share something. What's something that you could recommend someone do to enter our contest? So something based on what we've been discussing tonight, a personal action, community action too. Any thoughts? Just jump right in. How about using your bike? There you go. And instead of using your car. Yep, that's a good one. Thanks, Christiana. Any other thoughts on that? I mean, one that comes to mind for me is, is uh, joining one of the fix-it clinics. Uh, just, I mean, because for me, I was just observing on Saturday and I was, I was amazed at what, what could be done. Uh, so you can, you can come as an observer. You don't have to fix things and give advice or bring something. You can just check it out to see because you'll probably have something broken and need to, to connect with them so you know what's going on. Um, Eileen, did you want to add something? Oh, you can join your local Buy Nothing group. The entire city has uh, neighborhood groups. We have more than 20 in London. So go on and give your stuff away. <laughs> and get yes. some free stuff. <laughs> I agree. That's a great one. So yeah, the fact that you can join a one of 20 groups, you can see where they are, where the closest one is to you. You can get a sense of the kind of discussions they're having. And I really like the way you describe that, Eileen, as well, about like what it is and what it is not uh, as well. So people can get an idea by visiting and going to check out um, some of those uh, 20 different buy nothing groups for sure. Anyone else want to jump in on that question? Some uh, personal action someone could take after tonight? I will suggest that you get a picture hugging a tree. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's good stuff. I can jump in here as well. Yeah. Again, I got two points. So one is uh, being a responsible consumer. Um, so really, uh, you know, looking at the, the product that, that, that you're buying, um, how it's manufactured, what it's manufactured from, um, and looking at it downstream, um, you know, where, you know, where it originated, who, who manufactured that product. Uh, secondly, is mining your waste stream. I call it mining a waste stream. But when you're when you're being mindful of what you're placing into the into the into the garbage, um, right? So you know, uh, you know, is an item you know can an item be repaired? Can it be reused? Can it be remanufactured? Um, you know, or can it you know can it be donated? Or can it be you know does it that doesn't need to go into the, in, into the waste stream? So just being mindful of uh, of what you're placing into the garbage. Can it be recycled? Yeah. Terrific, excellent points. And there you go. You got some, some great suggestions to uh, post on uh, social media. We'll talk about that in a bit, but I see from the clock on the wall that it's just about uh, 8.10. So we'll conclude our question and answer period, but thank you so much for those great questions, great comments, good discussion. Um, it's just nice to see because we can't 
see you most of the time. It's just nice to, to kind of get a sense of who's out there and engage in some way in this virtual environment. So um, with that, I'm going to know, I'm going to now pass things back to Deepika to wrap up the event. So welcome back, Deepika. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to share my screen once again. And yeah, thank you so much, Joanna. Um, we, you just talked about the contest, but this is just a reminder that November 26th is the last day to submit your submission. Um, all details are found on our website. And if you follow us on social media, you can find details for that as well. And if you enjoyed this session, remember we have four more Green in the City events coming up. Um, next week's session will build on tonight's topic by exploring the concept of circular economies um, with some wonderful speakers yet again that are leading the way in London. Um, you can register for our upcoming sessions on our website. And we also have a feedback form for the series, which can be found at the link, which we will put in the chat. Um, this will be very helpful and useful for us just to know how we can improve these events going forward. Um, it only takes a couple of minutes to complete. So if you have the chance, I highly encourage you to do it. And if you would like to stay up to date with us on upcoming events like this one, volunteer opportunities and so on, um, be sure to sign up for our newsletter through our website. And once again, we're super excited to be collaborating with the London Public Library and the City of London in organizing these Green in the City sessions. So I hope you enjoyed it. And finally, just to wrap up, um, I just want to say thank you to all of our amazing speakers for tonight, our supporters, and thank you to all of you, our attendees, for attending tonight and learning more about what London is doing in terms of environmental action and how you could get involved. So I hope everyone enjoyed um, tonight's event, and I hope you all have a good night. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. All the panelists, thank you so much.